Hey guys, what's up? It's Greg Swarovski with the Find Your Film Podcast. I'm here with Adam Siegel, the, a really interesting filmmaker who I, I'm really going to actually ask a whole bunch of questions. His latest film is Nandor Fodor and the Talking Mongoose. My first question to you, Adam, is how long did it take for you to come up with that name? Because there are times when my I, I do hesitate to actually, I might get it wrong. So talk about that title. Oh, man. I mean... The title's a bit ridiculous, to be honest. I mean, it is a story about a man named Nandor Fodor and a talking mongoose, so it couldn't be more direct. And, you know, I probably agonized for a long time over various very clever names, and I said, you know what? It's about a guy named Nandor Fodor and a talking mongoose. Let's make it very direct. And then I loved it, and then everybody loved it. And then there was a sort of a a a studio effort to change the name at the last second, and both Simon and I were like, no, we're keeping it, and it stayed. So how do you fight the law and win? Is there, is there an unlock to that? It doesn't usually, you want the honest truth is have Simon in your corner. Usually with, when it's just me, they're like, nah. And then Simon's like, no. And they're like, okay. So that's the honest answer. Okay. So honest assessment of your film, I was watching it and I, I, I found it to be quite resonant, especially the third act. And it's one of these films that I feel is on one hand, you can take it as a light comedy, which is great. But then there are so many things bubbling inside. Am I overthinking no. or not? Can no, you- it is a, it, it, you know, <laughs> I definitely intended it to have some deeper meaning for sure. I mean, I when I wrote this script, I was going through a lot of deep things in my own life. And I, and, you know, sort of the the synthesis of how this script and eventually film came about was that I had heard this story about Nandor Fodor and the talking mongoose on the Isle of Man that was ridiculous. But I, I just wanted, you know, I always thought it was just a funny thing. I was like, okay. But then it wasn't until I kind of married it to some very sort of personal, religious sort of experiences that it became what it is. And so, yeah, I mean, there's definitely some very important, to me at least, messages in the film. You talk about Cass and Christopher Lloyd in the film, and I just thought the bookends where he's talking to Simon Pegg, I could just do two hours of them at a bar. I know, me too. Drinking Guinness and just talking about life. But what was your idea behind casting Christopher Worley? There's a movie that I love called Things to Do in Denver When You're Dead, when he delivers an amazing monologue. What did you see in him as far as the fabric of your narrative? Chris is so great. I mean, I just wanted a distinguished older gentleman, honestly, for that role who was American. And when the producer started talking about Christopher Lloyd, I was like, really? We could get Chris Lloyd to do this? And he loved the script. And I had a couple of Zoom calls with him and he was lovely. And he came out and just brought this sort of very distinguished you know, very eloquent sort of flair to that role that I absolutely loved. And he's an absolutely lovely man. We've become friends. He's got so many stories, as you can imagine. He's just a great guy. Yeah. You know, with Nando Fordor, there's so many great little uh, subplots that one of my things is this could have been a two hour, two and a half hour movie. Can you just talk about making it a lean narrative? Because were you ever tempted because there's there's so much rich stuff to glean from your story, but really, ultimately, you wanted to keep it lean and, and spare. Yeah, spare. you know, well, one thing that I did always want to do with this, I still wanted it to feel like a dark comedy. I still wanted it to feel, I never wanted it to feel kind of preachy or dramatic. You know, like I wanted those moments to come about. Like, I guess if I was trying to emulate anyone and I don't, you know, not from a visual perspective necessarily, but from a, from a narrative perspective is Wes Anderson. And I love the way that his films are always housed in comedies. They're always framed as comedies, but then they have these moments that are very dramatic that come about naturally. And so I think I looked at it from that perspective with regard to how I wanted it to be edited and how I wanted it to flow and the length of it. I still wanted the audience to feel like they were watching a comedy, but then to come away and be like, oh, wow, like now that I think about what that guy actually said, man, that's that's deep. You know, can you talk about that slippery slope as far as a person trying to do their good deed by stating, hey, person A, this is the facts here before you. But then there's that flip side of sometimes a family like the Irvings, they're happy, they're OK, they're accepting. Exactly. Cer- can you just talk about that? Well, that's push one pull. of the most important aspects of the film. And and the lovely character of Errol, played by uh, Gary Beetle, says it at one point. And he just says, I need to just let people be happy. Let people believe what they want to believe. And that's a part of it. And, and, and I do think that that is an important moral in life. The problem is when it starts to bleed onto other people. More 
atrocities have been committed in the name of religion on this planet than pretty much almost anything else. Like, let's be real. So as soon as you get into trying to force or impose even subtly your beliefs onto others or harming them because of, of something that can't quite 100% be proven as fact, that's where you lose me. So that's the fine line I think you're talking about. But you know, in the end, Jeff is harmless, like this, this mythos that these Irvings have created in this whole town believe. And so that I think is another layer of it with Nandor, you know, and it's his own search for meaning. And and it's like, he's so frustrated with them. And he's so angry with them. But but in the end, he's angry and frustrated with himself. You know, Adam, if I go on to your IMDb, because I'm actually excited now, I'm going to watch your past films. <laughs> Is there a lot of stuff to unpack from your films? Because I look at them and they go, okay, so this is a genre based thing on this, but look, yeah. there's other things uncovered. So can you talk yeah, about I mean, that? I don't, I don't, I never kind of set out to make simple films. Like I've taken a longer, harder road in my career for sure. I didn't, I'm just not interested in sort of superficial storytelling. It's just never been my thing. So my last film, Chariot, which was fine. It didn't work as well as Nandor because I was really ambitious with a lot of the things I was trying to do. But I did try to convey some very deep messages in that. And for me, what's most fulfilling is not, you know, we had a premiere of Nandor, a big screening of, about a week ago in LA and had like 400 people there and had so many people come up to me afterward. I loved it. It was beautiful. It was great. The lighting, the performances. And that's great. And I, I appreciate that. And I, I, technically tried to make a great movie. But what I really appreciated were a couple people who came up to me afterward and said, you know, there's this scene and there's this line that he says, and I thought about it a lot. And this, like, that's what I, because I've learned so much and my life has been shaped a lot by the films I've seen as, as crazy as that is. It's been an outlet for me to, you know, in some really messed up times in my life, the films have helped me. And so that's more what I'm going for is to try to get people to think, you know, Regarding I, don't always, I don't always achieve it, but that's always what I'm going for. <laughs> you know, you said it didn't work as well as Nando, but I'm excited to see Chariot. So I'm excited Thank to you. see some of your past work. But look, you talk about messed up times in, in your life. We've all had messed up times. What were the movies maybe right off the top that, that you went to for sort of that relief or comfort or maybe that dialogue? Yeah, that inter- The one that comes to immediately to mind was Raising Arizona. That movie is, to me, it's a perfect film. And what that movie shaped my life in a couple ways. That's the film that made me want to get want to get into filmmaking. And one of the reasons was because I came from a very prosy background, you know, of books and novels and Shakespeare and and classic literature. And I love that style of writing. And I never had quite kind of thought of how that could be married to contemporary filmmaking. And then I saw that movie as a kid. And it was so intelligent and it used the type of language that I loved in books and things like that. And I went, oh, okay, wait a minute. Maybe there is a way to like write really intelligent dialogue in a film because the Coens are the best. I mean, they're, they're some of the best writers and filmmakers out there. And then the ending of that movie just like totally just shook me. And, and it came out of nowhere. And it was like this comedy and it was weird and it was funny and it had these kind of poignant. And then the ending just like, floored me it was just this unbelievably bittersweet ending that really made me think a lot about my life and I was young again when I saw that movie I was like late teens but it really kind of changed me in a lot of ways so that's just one that comes to mind there have been lots Adam I know there's no way to cheat that or there's no unlock or there's no way to cheat the game but you write at a pretty good clip because and I'm factoring in you as a producer you as a director, I think you're on post or you just wrapped this yeah. movie called The Tower. I am. Uh, that said, with hard work and everything, is there an unlock to what you do? What is your workflow as a writer? Because with everything that you do, I think writing has to be that anchor for yeah. things to get off the ground. Oh, so yeah. what is yeah? What is your daily I'm a writer. Like? I'm a writer above all else. And the trick is just don't sleep. I mean, honestly, that's it. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. But, but no, I wrote – see, I actually wrote Nandor – while I was filming Chariot, I would come home at night after filming, I would, you know, take a shower and then I would sit on the couch and write for, and and the thing with me and my writing process is it doesn't actually take me that long to write a script. Like Nandor, I wrote in about two weeks. The, pro- the part that takes me a long time is thinking about it. I'll think about a script for 10 years and I'll think about all that I want in it and I will 
think about the beats and I'll think about the story and I'll think about the characters and I'll make little notes and I'll, I'll here and there, I'll jot down this like block of text about a character or about a scene or something like that. And then eventually when I feel like I have enough and I'm at that like sort of like moment of artistic readiness, then I embark on it and then it's all there. And I've thought about it for long enough that it's just connecting the dots. And it's never taken me more than three to four weeks to actually write a script. And even that's writing for 30, 40 minutes, an hour a day. My goodness. Is that, do you have to trick your body after a hard day's work on, <laughs> yeah. on, on production as far as like, oh, okay, man, so I'm no dude, directing. I was literally just talking to somebody. I went through a kind of a gnarly breakup while I was filming the tower. And it was like, it, it, I, I was trying to explain it to, to, and I was commiserating with a fellow filmmaker that like, I honest to God, writing and directing a movie especially an independent film it's like being in a car crash every day like the amount of like of adrenaline and readiness that you have for 12 to 14 hours every single day and having to be constantly artistically prepared and have answers to every question and be able to fix every problem you know it's it's crazy man it's it, i mean I, not to be dramatic because there's much harder jobs out there i'm sure working in a coal mine or something like that is pretty freaking rough but it's it's all consuming i mean it's incredibly difficult and you have uh, hundreds of people or oh, 100 people in the production exactly. coming to you for for you answers how do you counting on you how do you streamline that? And then plus you life happens. You can't say, yeah. I want to stop production for a month to just relax and play video games and, and uh, tune everyone out. What's the, what, how do you do that? The, you know, you just grin and bear it, man. I I've started now where I will like train, like I'm training for a marathon when I'm getting ready to do a movie and I will make sure I'm in fantastic shape, meditate, you know, just get as ready as possible and go into it knowing that it's going to, it's going to be rough. And then, you know, you just, you just hang on, <laughs> you know, you just kind of do it and just like focus, you know, you just focus on what you're doing. And don't, for me, one thing that's super important as, as funny enough is like every moment that I'm not on set, I have to have like utter solitude. Like I can't be living with someone. I can't be talking. to Like I literally leave set go home by myself, lay there by myself, you know, like read or write or something by myself. I try not to talk to anyone. Like, it's like, you kind of just have to turn it off when you get offset. Oh my gosh. What, what happens when people, when your friends say, remember that phrase, no man is an Island. John Dunn said it. What do you say? That's to them? not true while filming. I, I think, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that is definitely not the case. I think Hemingway had a similar quote that I would have to find, but it was something like, I love my family. I love my children, but not when I'm writing. Like, it's true. Like, you just don't have, the, you, 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 maybe other people can. Maybe there's these, you know, I, I heard that, like, Steven Spielberg was editing Schindler's List while filming Jurassic Park or the other way around. And I'm like, I, okay, cool. Like, that's why he's Spielberg. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know what to say about that. Final couple questions. Okay, so someone watches Nandor and they're really excited to see your work. First off, the uh, two-part question is, what can that person expect from the tower? And then the second part of that question, after Nandor, what should that person see next from your filmography and why? Uh, yeah, so Tower is a story about a small town in the south of the United States with a mermaid living in the water tower. And it's very dark. It's very different than Nandor, very different feel. I, Nandor, I wanted to feel very cinematic, very classic, very period piece. Tower has all handheld shots. It's a lot of natural light. I wanted it to feel very different. It's very different. Couldn't be more different than Nandor. Uh, that's kind of me. I'm all over the place as an artist. Um, and that one, I'm just starting post. So I would say six to eight months is probably when that one would start to become a thing and come out. You know, Chariot is a challenging film, but it's beautiful. I love it. It's one of my babies and it's my last film. And, you know, it, it's one that I care deeply about. And so, yeah, I mean, check it out. It's out there. It's on Amazon and everything. And, you know, I think that I would always tell people to watch Nandor first because I think it's my best work. I think it gives the 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 best sort of introduction to who I am as an artist and what I'm trying to portray. And then Chariot's sort of like you know, my, my Barton Fink to my Raising Arizona. Well, although oh. Barton Fink is a much better film. Barton Fink's a classic. So, yeah. Yeah. Barton Fink <laughs> is a classic. So you mentioned, uh, last questions, you mentioned Barton Fink, you mentioned Raising Arizona. Right off the top of your head, can you just recommend a film that 
that you feel is maybe underrated or is a gem that really speaks to you just for our podcast listeners to check out? Just a movie I mean, it's that not even really... under, I don't, don't even think it's underrated, I, but the way of seeing it, they, I know that Neon's been doing this sort of re-release of the original Korean old boy and it's been in theaters and I saw it in the theater. And I'm sure most of you, if you're, you're cool and like movies have seen that, but see it in the theater. It was a really unique, amazing experience. One of my favorite films. And lastly, before you go, amazing experience. I'm assuming that can qualify for your collaboration with Simon Pegg. Am I? Oh yeah, man. I mean, Simon is just an absolute consummate professional in every way. He's lovely. Everyone on set was in love with him. I'm in love with him. He's an absolutely incredible man. And you know, I couldn't have been more lucky to work with an artist like that. He's a beautiful, beautiful actor. His performance is great. His demeanor is great. He's a great guy. And in camera, seeing Mini Driver perform in that that pub and just seeing it, it just feels like a life is unfolding before you. Am I yeah. overstepping my bounds? It just feels no. so real. Yeah. No, Mini is. Mini brought so much to that character that I didn't even write. I talked about this at the premiere. Like, Mini was so funny. And she brought so much humor to that character that was not necessarily even in the script. She just brought it. She, like, she found it. And it was beautiful. Like, her performance, I'm in awe of her performance in this. She's really great. Adam, thank you so much for your time. Really love your film. Yeah, of course. Look, looking forward to speaking to you regarding uh, Tower or The Tower? The Tower. The Tower. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Of course, man. Nice to meet you.